It's been a while. You may be wondering where I have been. Um, To be transparent, I went through some things in the past few years. And um, my relationship with God just simmered, basically. I don't go to church anymore. I wasn't talking to God anymore. I wasn't praying anymore. I wasn't reading and studying anymore. And the situation I was going through, I blamed God for. And the, and that's why I really haven't done anything. It's just kind of just been existing for the past few years. And I withdrew from God and withdrew from people. And I mean, it's just where it's been for me for the past few years. So currently I'm working on my relationship with God. We, 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 we going through counseling or whatever. And um, <laughs> I started by reading my Bible and I come across this story, which is very, very short, but it is deeply misconstrued online. I have seen so many Facebook posts about this story that have been taken out of context that I decided maybe I should explain it. Okay. So that's what I'm going to do today. We're going to explain that story. And what story is that? It's the story in Genesis where the guy busts a nut and die. Let's do this. In order for us to understand this story today, we must first read in context. Context has three rules. Rule number one, language. The Bible was not originally written in English, people. It was originally written Old Testament, Ancient Hebrew, New Testament, and Ancient Greek. What you need to understand as an English speaker is that sometimes these sentences are translated straight out of Hebrew and it's written in the way you would say it in Hebrew. That is why some of the sentence structure of the Old Testament in particular can be strange or sound strange to us because we aren't Hebrew speakers. So we don't kind of understand exactly what they're saying, even though the sentence is in English because it has the construct of a Hebrew sentence. Every language has a different structure for their sentences. Rule number two of context, history and culture. Ladies and gentlemen, you cannot apply 2022 American culture to the Bible, okay? You cannot do that. This is an ancient culture of Israel, which is completely different from modern American culture. Different cultures have different rules, different customs, and different way of doing things. The third and final rule of context is the Holy Spirit. Without God resting on your shoulders to walk you through this book, you will not understand it. Trust me, I have tried to understand this Bible and I have failed. But since asking God to help a sister out, it has happened. Holy Spirit, it is a must. Before you get into this story, you need the three rules of context. Number one, you got to understand language. Number two, you got to understand the history and the culture of which the scripture was written in. And number three, you have got to have the Holy Spirit. Once you get all three of those, Turn your Bible to Genesis 38 and let's get the story started. Now, another mistake that people make, so people will take one little bitty part of the Bible and they'll put it on this grand scale and they'll be like, oh, God just killed the man because he buzzing up. Um, honey, what happened prior to that? So you have to, you have to read it in its entirety, okay? Book of Genesis chapter 38 starts off with Judah, who is the son of Jacob. So y'all know that Jacob, Jacob was his original name, but God changed his name to Israel. And when Jacob had children, the children became the fathers of the tribes of Israel. Jacob traveled everywhere with his family, which means that his children traveled with him all the time. Even through adulthood, they all traveled together in a group. Judah breaks away from his family, I guess, to start his own little life or whatever. He goes to a place and he meets a Canaanite woman. Her name is Shua, Shua, Shua. Her name's at the bottom of the screen. If you if you know how to pronounce that, kudos to you, my nigga, because I, I, 
He marries her. He has three kids with her. Er, Onan, Shala, or Sheila, or Sh Shala. You, the name's at the bottom of the screen. You know. Er married a woman named Tamar. The Bible says that Er was a very wicked person. So God killed him. And the death of Er left Tamar widowed. Back then they practiced what is called levered marriage. Levered marriage is when within a tribe, if a man died and he left a wife, another male kin of his had to marry his wife and produce an heir. And that heir will belong to the deceased man. So in this case, Ur died. So Judah wanted Onan to marry Tamar to produce a child. And that child would belong to Ur and further Ur's bloodline. So whatever children Tamar had by Onan, they would belong to Ur. Leverage marriage operated as a way to further the bloodline as well as, you know, take care of the woman she needed a husband and unfortunately back in those days a woman's worth was only in who she was married to and how many children she had and as previously stated tamar wasn't married to anyone and she had no kids so onan was her only hope in having a life now if you read the bible clearly states Onan did not want to have a child with Tamar because he knew that the heir would not be considered his child. However, he still had sex with her despite not wanting to give her a baby and provide her with a home and care. He just wanted to fuck. So that's exactly what he did. He took her. He had sex with her. And then he ejaculated, jizzed, utilized the pull-out method, bust a nut on the ground, and then he died. Here comes the great debate. God killed that man cause, cause he bust a nut, he pulled out. No, he died cause he lied, man. Real reason that old man was struck dead after pulling out and shooting it on the ground was because of lust. He had no intentions of fulfilling his promise. And back then, word was bond. If you said you was gonna do something, you're supposed to do it. And when you didn't do it, there was consequences for that. Nah, some of you may be looking at this like, well, I mean, it was a leveraged marriage, so he had to marry her. All he had to do was say no. And I'm gonna tell you the way leveraged marriage works. Okay, so, Er was Onan's brother. And if Onan had said no, because Onan was the second oldest. So if Onan had said no, that means that the third brother, Shalah, he could have taken her as a wife if he wanted to. But if he said no, then it goes to the next male within the family, which is more than likely an uncle since Judah didn't have any more kids. An uncle. And if an uncle said no, then it would go to the, the, the nephew. If the nephew said no, it would go to the cousin. Then it keep going down like that. It was not a requirement to participate in leveret marriage. Well, Jerrica, how do you know that leveret marriage wasn't a requirement? Let me tell you how I know. There's a story in the Bible. In the book of Ruth. Ruth was married to Naomi's son. But if you remember in the story, Naomi's husband and Naomi's two sons died. Mind you, Naomi's two sons were married to two Moabite women because Ruth was not from Israel. She was a Moabite woman. And remember when Naomi's husband and sons died, she told both girls to go back to their they families and try to find other husbands or whatever they do. And Ruth followed Naomi back to her home. Naomi went back to the tribe of Judah. Where does leveraged marriage come in? Boaz is the cousin of Ruth's deceased husband. When Boaz saw her in the field, he went and asked two other men if he could marry her. At the time of me reading that, I didn't understand why he was doing that until I did more research on leveraged marriage and I figured it out. Those two men that he asked were in direct line to marry her first. So he had to ask those two people, yo, can I marry Ruth? One of them, I think it was the uncle. He said, no, I don't want to marry her. And then his son said, no, I don't want to marry her. So that made Boaz be the third chosen to marry her. So he, he married her. It's okay, and, and none of those dudes died. So that lets me know, bringing us back to Genesis, that Onan could have said no 
and just went on by his life. But no, he wanted to get them draws. And he got them draws, and then he died. It's like, oh man, his logic was so flawed to me. Because, yeah, every son he produced through Tamar would technically belong to his brother. But that didn't mean that Onan wouldn't have children. Because Onan could have taken a second wife. Back then, that history and culture, they practiced polygamy. You could have more than one wife. He could have took a second wife. And he could have had children through that wife. But he was so stuck on, well, if I have a baby with Tamar, then all my children are going to belong to her. And I'm thinking he must not have liked his brother that much anyway for not to want to further his brother's bloodline because most dudes that participated in every marriage was cool with it. He wasn't. So I'm assuming that he didn't like his brother that much. He was like, I don't want to get that nigga no air, but I would f his wife. I bet you think after that the story is over. It's not over. There's more to the story. And I like to call Tamar the best finesser in the Bible. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me start. Let me finish the story. Onan dies after he utilizes the pullout method and le leaves his children on, on, the, on the floor. Tamar was distraught because as previously stated, as a widowed woman with no children, how was she to be taken care of? How she did she wasn't gonna have a life. So Judah said, um, when my third son gets of age, you can marry him and then you can have children. Only oh, got it honestly, y'all, because that nigga was lying. So lying seems to come easily in this doggone family. Shala eventually ages up. But Tamar never marries him. And sis picks up on game. While Tamar is waiting for Shala to age up, she is sent to stay with her father, which is where unmarried women and widow women be, the ones that don't have children. Did you live with your father until there was a man to take care of you? Tamar hears about Shala aging up. And she notices she ain't heard a word from Judah. Because if Tamar daddy die, who gonna take care? She has nothing. She can't. She will not be taken care of. Judah had no intentions of marrying his son off the of Tamar. She old and he don't care no more, to be honest. At this time, Judah's wife dies. And he goes to a place that I cannot pronounce. <laughs> he goes there. He mourns her. And then he goes up to visit his friend and to shear his sheep. And... Apparently, wherever he went must be in the neighborhood that Tamar lived because somebody came to her and told her, hey, ain't that your father in going up there? They say he going up there to shit his sheep. Let me go see my father-in-law. Tamar was a widow. And back then, you dressed a certain way. And when you dressed a certain way, people knew, I guess you could say, your social status. <clears throat> Virgins dressed a certain way. Widows dressed a certain way. Whores dressed a certain way or wore certain colors or uh, wrapped their stuff. I don't know how you say it, hijab, hijab. They wore them, they wrapped them a certain way. You could tell the status of a woman by the clothes that she wore. Tamar takes off her widow garments. So it says that she put on, you know, a veil, wrapped it a certain way and she sat in an open area so that Judah would see her when he passed by. Now, when Judah saw her, he thought she was a hoe, so she must have been dressed like a prostitute. He didn't recognize her because her face was covered. Mind you, his wife just died, so maybe he just wanted a little bit of company. He saw a whore sitting over there all by her lonesome, and he was like, you know, let me entertain her because, you know, I'm lonely and my wife just died. Because Tamar was like, you know, I got to secure my bag. And she said, well, what you going to give me if I let you have sex with me? He said, I'm going to give you a young goat. And she said, well, you give me a pledge letting me know that you sent the goat. And then he asked her, you know, what kind of pledge? And she said, your signet and cord and the staff that's in your hand. So basically... Whenever he sent the goat, he was supposed to send his signet, which I, I'm assuming is like a crest, a family crest or a family symbol, a cord, 
which I guess is like a chain or a necklace or something. And then the staff that he had in his hand. Those three items would prove that the goat was sent by him and to her. Okay, I feel like I didn't explain this correctly. What was happening was, since Judah didn't have any money on hand, Tamar told him to give her three things to hold until he sends her the goat. And once she received the goat, she would send the three things back to him. That would be the form of payment. Are you keeping up with me? Keep up with me. Keep up with me because those three things, those three things will become important in just a minute. Judah gave her those, those three things and he's supposed to send the, the goat afterward. So they have sex and he go by his business. When Judah goes back, he tries to send the goat back. He told his friend, who name I cannot pronounce, some of the A. He told his friend, take this goat back to the, the hole that was in this area. So the friend take the goat up there and he don't find the hole. Mind you, Tamar done already left and she done went back home and put on, she went back to her daddy's house and she done put on her widow clothes again. So Judah was like, well, I mean, I guess. Three months after this happened, it is obvious that she's pregnant. So she's showing now. So they, they go tell Judah, you know, your daughter-in-law has played the harlot. Mind you, <clears throat> let me go back to history and culture. Let me go back. Although Tamar is in her father's home, she's still technically owned by Judah because of her marriage to Judah's son. So that meant that she was supposed to get with somebody in Judah's tribe. She was supposed to stay within his family through leverant marriage, okay? Now Judah is hearing Tamar is pregnant and he's like, well, I didn't give her Shalom. So that means she out here hoeing. So this fool had the audacity to say, burn her for being a whore. But Tamar was like, uh -huh, uh -huh, I got the last laugh, nigga. Tamar produces those three very important items. His signet, his cord, and his staff. She send those back by some men and she says, the child that I am carrying is by the man who owns these three items. The man bring the items back to Judah and he was like, oh uh, Judah Pete game. He wasn't mad because he was like, you know what I'm saying? He was, go he was doing wrong by her anyway. And so he ended up getting got anyway. And he was like, you know what? Them my kids. I'm gonna take care of her and I'm gonna take care of my children. And that's that. <laughs> Tamar goes on to give birth to twins. Their names are Zara and Perez. If you was a Bible geek like me, you would know that Jesus is a descendant of Perez. If you've ever noticed one thing in all of the Bible stories, the final destination is and will always be Jesus. Well, Jerrica, how can you compare a story in Genesis about Jesus. Like, how is the destination Jesus? Let me tell you how. Jesus will always be the final destination and God will always use a situation to steer us right back to Jesus. Because early on in the Bible, your boy Jacob did not want to marry Leah. He wanted to marry Rachel. But Leah was the wife that God picked for him. He still got to marry Rachel, but he had to marry Leah and he had to have children through Leah. And guess what? Judah came from Leah, and guess what? Jesus is a is a descendant of the tribe of Judah. And then Judah went on to not even marry a woman of the Israel uh, tribe. He ended up marrying a Canaanite woman, and the devil thought, hmm, that's going to mess up the bloodline. But the Lord was like, ha, ha, think again, because Perez was born, and guess what? He's an ancestor of Jesus. Shall we go on? Ruth and Boaz, ladies and gentlemen, Ruth was not an Israelite woman, but guess what? Boaz was a man of the tribe of Judah, and guess what? Ruth converted to Christianity, and guess what? She ended up having a son named Obed, and guess who Obed was? The father of Jesse, and guess who Jesse was? The father of King David, so that made Ruth the great-grandma or the grandma of King David, and guess what? Guess who was born through King David? bloodline jesus oh but the devil thought that he could get rid of the children of israel so nearly all the tribes were wiped out all 12 except one <laughs> one tribe remained you know what tribe that was the tribe of judah you know what tribe jesus descended from the tribe of judah can i go on oh we going on because through the tribe of judah guess what comes judaism guess what comes through judaism jews jewish people what was jesus again 
a Jew. King Herod was like, you know what? They say the Savior is going to be born. So let me kill all the little boys from the ages of zero to three so that he cannot be here in any possible way. But guess what happened? Mary and Joseph went to Bethlehem. And guess who was born? <laughs> if you don't understand who I'm talking about yet, I'm talking about Jesus because Jesus was born. Oh, but it doesn't stop there. Oh, no, it doesn't stop there. It don't stop there at all. Because they thought that if they hang this man on a cross that he going to die, that that's going to be the end of Jesus. But oh, that was not the end of Jesus. <laughs> because after dying on that cross three days later he rose again and the final destination is and will always be Jesus every time you can't stop nothing the devil can't stop nothing at the end of it all because the Bible tells us in the end every knee shall bow every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord so guess what Jesus will and always will be the final destination no matter what you do no matter what I do no matter what the devil do no matter what kind of monkey wrench he done thrown into the plan guess what Jesus is still the final destination guess what Jesus still gonna get the glory guess what it's still gonna happen y'all might call him G-O-D, but I call him G-P-S, because that nigga will reroute. <laughs>